there are certain best practices every C-sharp application should follow, right? Probably dry, solid, logging, dependency injection, separation of concerns, and unit testing at the very least. These seem like obvious things that every application should have. Now in this video, we're gonna do something a bit unique. I'm gonna show you how to do all those things. And I'm gonna show you why you shouldn't always do those things. We're gonna build the ultimate Hello World application. You definitely won't wanna miss it. Now, if you don't know me, my name is Tim Corey, and it's my goal to make learning C-sharp easier. I do that by providing videos here on YouTube multiple times per week, plus I have a weekly podcast. I also provide courses on C-sharp, web development, and much more at IamTimCorey.com. The profits from those sales are what pays for the free content here on YouTube, so that everyone can have a great education in C-sharp, not just those who can afford it. Now, in this video, as in my, most of my videos, I'm going to create some source code. If you like a copy of that source code, use the link in the description. All right, let's go to our Visual Studio. Here we have Visual Studio 2022, and we're going to create a new project. We're going to create a console application. We're going to call this Ultimate Hello World. We'll call it Ultimate Hello World App. We're going to hit Next and .NET 6. Now, right out of the box, Microsoft has given us some code. And if we were to run this, let's run this, we can see it says, hello world, and it closes the application. But you know, if you look at this, it's not following any best practices. I mean, and I'm talking a little tongue in cheek here, but there is no logging. There's, what if there was an exception that happened? What if you wanted to have a different message besides hello world? What if you wanted to have it in a different language, depending on the language of the user? What if, and the list goes on. So today what we're gonna do is we're going to build the ultimate Hello World application to see how to apply all of these best practices to this application. Now, I want to take a pause right here to say that there's a reason why I'm doing this. Now, part of it is you get to see a little bit of everything. You're going to see unit testing and um, dry and even translations for wording and how to do interfaces and dependency injection inside of console applications. There's a lot of stuff we're going to pack in here in a short amount of time. But the other part here is I often get people that look at an application and say, that application is not good because it doesn't do X. It isn't dry or it doesn't follow all of solid or it doesn't have, you know, isn't break everything out into its own nougat package or, and the list goes on of the things they've seen. And this really comes down to a mindset that best practices aren't suggestions, they are requirements. You have to do all these things in order to make your application the best. So the, the misunderstanding is that the best means having best practices and all of them in your application. And that's not true. So what we're gonna do today is see how we can turn really what turns out to be one line of code into something a bit more. All right, so we're gonna get rid of this one line of code because that's not good enough for us. We're going to redo this into a proper application. So the first thing we need to do is with any good application, and again, I'm talking tongue in cheek here, but at the same time, if your application is of a larger size, these are actually all good things to do. So at the end, we're going to wrap up and talk about when you'd use each of these things at what size. Now it's not a specific at 300 lines, you do this, but there will be some discussion on when to use and when not to use certain things. So don't um, stick around to the end because it's really important to kind of wrap this up at the end. But for any application, we need to have a class library. In a class library, you can separate out your business logic and your data access from your user interface. So a new project, and this will be a class library. And we'll call this, um, uh, hello world helper. 
or Hello World Library. How about that? Yes, we'd say .NET 6, and we'll get rid of class one right away. We don't need that. We don't want that. Now, from here, what we need to do is, I think we first need to define our data. So let's right click on Hello World and say Add, and we're gonna say New Item, and we're gonna search for a new type of item called JSON. And it's just JavaScript object notation. And we're gonna call this file, let's call it uh, custom text. And we're gonna get rid of the sample data inside of it and just have our curly brace. I'm sorry, actually get rid of the curly braces too. Start off the beginning. And we're gonna start with square brackets for an array. Inside there, we're gonna have curly braces. And we'll say language, equals en. So we're gonna have English language. This is the English language translations. So this is a file that has the, the various languages and their translations for each thing. So we're gonna have translation section. And in here, we'll say greeting, and that will be hello world. Okay, and that's all we'll have in there. But now what we can do is we can copy this whole thing and let's create a, a Spanish version as well. So ES for Spanish. And instead of hello world, the translation of that would be hola mundo. There we go. Uh, actually, let's capitalize M. There we go. So that's now our, our translated version of hello world. It's hola mundo. Okay, so now we have this translation file. Let's make sure it's included in the build. So we right click and go to properties. And we say, we want this to copy if it's newer. So every time you build, it's gonna copy this to the output if there's been changes made. And of course, the first time it will copy because there's no file there already. So that takes care of for us our, our uh, translation file, but now we need to have a model to put this into when we load it. So let's right click on our, our class library. We're gonna say add, we'll say models, new folder. And then in here, we're gonna add a class and let's call this class custom text to match our, our JSON file. And that's just a you know, name preference. You don't have to name it that way, but we'll do our semicolon here to do file scope namespaces. I'll make this public. Now, as we go, I'm doing a lot of this stuff pretty fast. And if you go, whoa, Tim, I wanna learn more about that. I do have larger videos that cover, I think every bit of these topics. So if you want logging, we have multiple videos on YouTube. I have multiple videos on YouTube that cover that. Um, if you want uh, reading right from JSON files, we do that in multiple different places. If you want unit testing, I have videos on that and on down the list we go, depends the injection and so on. So a lot of this is covered other places. If you are a student that's taking the C-sharp master course, then all of this is covered in that. So in our custom text, who's our model, we wanna have a string that is a language and we wanna have a dictionary of type string, string that is translations, okay? And that matches up language and translations match up to language and translations. Now notice this is lowercase, whereas in my um, model they're uppercase, and that's because of the fact that uh, this is the C-sharp standard, whereas this is the JSON standard. So JSON is camel case by default, whereas in C sharp for our models, we have Pascal case. So we're gonna have to figure out how to translate from one to the other, and I'll show you how to do that when we look those up. So now we have our, our text, and we have the model to load it into. Let's create a, a method that will actually do the, the work of loading up that information. So to do that, we have to right click on our, our uh, project and we'll say add. And 
let's put this into a folder because we're trying to be good citizens of everything we do. And so we're gonna organize these things. And this will be the, um, uh, let's call this the business logic. And in here, we're gonna say add class messages. And we're gonna do the same file scope namespaces. And again, I cover this in other videos why this does this, uh, but save us four lines of, uh, or four spaces on every line. Make it public. And here we're gonna do is, well, we should probably do, uh, a, not prop, um, a constructor, CTOR, I blanked there for a minute. CTOR for constructor, and we're gonna bring in an iLogger. We see you should log everything we do. iLogger, and if you control dot here, then we can have, um, actually, it's not gonna find uh, what I want. And I wanna do iLogger of messages. Like so, sometimes it finds a NuGet package, sometimes it doesn't. There we go. If you do iLogger of type messages, which is this class, then it says, oh, you probably wanna install the package Microsoft.extensions.logging.abstractions. Find install latest version. Yep, that's what we wanna do. So that now, adds that NuGet package, which if you right click on here and go to uh, manage NuGet packages, you'll see the same thing. Installed now is Microsoft.extensions.logging.abstractions. You could go on, go on here, browse for it, found it, installed it, and then used it and added the using statement up here. But that kind of shortened things up for us. We're gonna say log control dot to create a sign of field. There we go. So now we have the ability to log our, our work. Now, I think what we need to do is we should probably create a generic, let's make it private, but we say private uh, string look up custom text and by key and by language. All right, so what it's gonna do is we wanna be generic. We wanna not repeat ourselves, right? Keep this uh, dry. So we don't wanna just say, hey, look up this particular key. We wanna be generic and say, what key do you want? That's the one I'll look up. And of course we only have right now one key and that's greeting. And there's the, the value or there's the value, but we're going to do a look up this way because that way we can expand later. And so we'll say, hey, let's do a lookup. Well, first we need to uh, actually do a deserialize. Well, in order to do that, we need to say, I wanna have a, a list of custom text, which that's gonna add a using statement at the top. Notice it added the using statement up here for our models. And it needs to be nullable. And we're gonna say uh, message sets because it's gonna bring back um, a list of custom text because there's going to be one for English, one for Spanish at this point. I'm going to say equals JSON serializer, which add another using statement for system.text.json. This JSON serializer is a little different than newtonsoft.json. This is the newer JSON serializer deserializer. So I'm going to say JSON serializer dot deserialize and it's asking me, hey, do you want to do a, let's unpin this, a list of custom text? Well, yes, I do, but not with the key. So let's um, go to the new line here. And the key is not the key. Instead, I want to, and let's um, bring this paren down the next line. And we'll say file dot read all lines from custom text.json. All right, so that's gonna read all lines of the custom text.json, but we need to go a bit further than that. And why is it yelling at me now? Oh, it's not read all lines, it's read all text. Start with that. Um, so real text just gets, it puts everything into one string. And so we're gonna take that and put it into our deserialized method. 
But we have a problem because this is not going to match up properly because of the fact we have a casing difference in our names. So remember, we have Pascal case versus Camel case. So we need to create options. So JSON serializer options, call it options equals new. And I'll put curly braces on the new line. We'll say property name case insensitive equals true. And then that'll be it. Put a semicolon at the end. And then after this uh, file, we can say comma options. All right. And so we're passing in these options we create up here to say it's a case insensitive property name match. So now we should have our message sets loaded in this method. Now we've got to make sure that we protect ourselves in case there's any uh, problems. So let's do this. Let's wrap, let's actually cut this out and we're going to wrap this in a try catch. We'll catch the exception like so. And we're going to put that code in there. And then we should also log this. So log dot um, log dot log error. I'll say error looking up the custom text and we'll pass in the exception. Okay, so that will log it. We will throw it again though. So we can say, hey, we, we logged it, but we still want this to go up the chain to actually be handled saying, hey, we can't find this custom text or something went wrong. And the, uh, the exception method or exception object will show you what went wrong. So now you've got that wrapped. Now the next thing we can do is say custom text. We're gonna grab just the custom text we need. So messages equals uh, message sets and make sure it's, we say, if it's not null, then where, and we'll say x arrow x dot language equals the language you passed in. Notice that's right up here. I believe, no, it didn't add a link there for me. Um, okay, and now we've got that, that's going to return a I enumerable, but you don't want that. You want the first one. And you're going to say, well, Tim, if it doesn't find it, it's going to throw an exception, right? Yes, it will inside of our try, which we will log and then pass up the chain. Because if you pass in, let's say French FR, well, guess what? It's not going to find it in this where clause. Therefore, it can't return the first one. Therefore, it'll throw an exception that it couldn't find the first one which is what we want. We don't want it to say, oh, well, it's null and then put a null in the custom. No, we don't want to do that because we could end up giving a message that's just blank and thinking that we succeeded when in fact we failed because it was a missing message. There was no uh, message set to read from. So we want the exception to happen. So we're kind of embracing that. But then down here, we're going to say, if messages is null we want to throw new null reference exception and say the specified language was not found in the json file now this should never be hit because of the fact that we do have that uh, first up here but that just protects us again we're being very protective here we return messages dot translations. Now we have, we got to this point, we actually have a valid messages object and we're looking for the translation of this key. So we're going to say translations of key. And that should return the value of the translation, which if we come over here to our custom text.json, the translation of say greeting will be hello world if you'd passed in en for the language. If you'd passed in es, the translation of greeting would be hola mundo. So that's our custom text lookup. But now let's create a helper method, a method that is actually public. We're going to say public string greeting because we don't want 
to have these uh, these magic strings all over. We want to kind of hard code them somewhere. And so we're gonna hard code it into this method. So you're gonna pass in language. And then what we're gonna do in here is say string output equals look up custom text. And the key is greeting. And then we pass in the language that we passed through. So all this really does is we're going to return output. So all this really does is it creates a method for us called greeting, which we say, okay, give me the greeting text. Now I could say, well, let's match the, the method name up with the key. And then we will do, um, the uh, name of here. I think that's probably overkill, um, but overkill sometimes over underrated. Um, so if you want to do it, you could, um, you could say name of uh, greeting like so, and that would pull this method in here. But again, I think that's probably overkill. I just wanted to say greeting. And then that that's the only place we'll ever have this text. So there we go. And now we could get a little crazy. We could create um, a one place to have all these things matched up and no, this is good. So now we have this greeting method and that's what we, all the things we, things we need to do in this messages. We're gonna put this in dependency injection though. So we should probably have this be mockable. So we're gonna create an interface and the interface will have just one method greeting. So we hit Okay, and now we have iMessages. So with iMessages, we can now throw us into our dependency injection system and make sure that it properly uh, works through and, and gets the information, including iLogger. Um, and we can, again, mock this if we need to for unit testing. If we haven't gotten to yet, we'll get there in just a minute. But first, let's keep working on this, let's actually put in our dependency injection system, which means we have to go back to our console, which is right here, ultimate hello world, go to dependencies and add some NuGet packages. And the first we're gonna add is Microsoft dot extensions dot dependency injection dot abstractions. I'm sorry, not dot abstractions. And for whatever reason, I don't know if you noticed this, but when it first loaded, it loaded like this. If this happens to you, where you're looking for Microsoft extensions that depends the injection, and the first one up is not the exact match, look at the, the bar over here on the right. For whatever reason, mine is loading one tick below the top. So scroll back to the top and there you go. It's weird, I don't know why it's happening. I'm not sure if it's just for me or if it's for everybody, but so to look at, make sure that progress bar or that uh, slider to the top. So Microsoft extensions that depends the injection. We're gonna install that. And hit okay. We have one more though, and that's Microsoft extensions dot hosting. Now again, watch. You see how it's got that progress bar or that sorry that uh, vertical slider is not at the top. Scroll back up one, and there's Microsoft extensions dot hosting the exact match. So if it's happening to you, just note that um, if you don't find the exact match in there, make sure you scroll back to the top. So let's hit install on hosting. These two packages will help us with dependency injection and setting it up. Okay, so now we have that done. Let's go back to program.cs. Now in program.cs, we have a blank slate. So we're going to, first of all, right click on dependencies and a product reference to the hello world library. And let's add a using statement. Hello world library uh, dot business logic. And I don't know that we need to have one for models. So we're going to leave that off for now. And then we also need to have a, uh, a using for uh, Microsoft dot extensions dot dependency injection that new package will be added and another one for Microsoft dot extensions dot hosting the other new package we just added. So now you can say using I host host 
equals create host builder args dot build. Okay, now create host builder. Let's make sure I spell it right. Well, this is silly. I got ahead of myself. I have to create the create host builder, of course. So static I host builder, create host builder. And we're going to do the curly braces for this. And we'll say return host.create default builder, passing the args. So what are we doing here? Well, this is if you've worked with, let's say, ASP.NET Core products like Blazor or uh, MVC or API, you'll probably have seen this in the program.cs file where we have something similar, where it creates a host builder and sets some things up. That's what we're doing here. What the host builder does, the default host builder, if you mouse over it, um, is it sets up things like iConfiguration, iLogging Factory, and um, so much more for setting up our, our default stuff. Uh, and in this case, what we're going to do is include in it dependency injection. So we're going to say in the new line, dot configure services. And we'll say open one parentheses, open a second one, and we're going to have a discard character for the action. And then pat, say services. Okay, and then we're going to say arrow. And then in here, we can say services dot add transient, add singleton, and so on. Let's add uh, a singleton for our I messages. And the implementation is messages, like so. And now we have dependency injection configured. And so with that, we can now, when it builds, we'll have dependency injection set up for our application. So with that, the only thing you need to do is we're going to say using, and notice I'm using these, these usings here. What this does is it says um, when we close out of the application, make sure to properly dispose of this, uh, this uh, variable. There you go. That's the name. <laughs> so it disposes of this variable properly at the end. It releases all the resources. So we'll say using var scope equals host dot services dot create scope. So we're going to create a scope for our dependency injection, which is basically the scope is the entire application, um, but that determines for us uh, lifetimes and things like that. So with that, we are now ready to say var services equals scope dot service provider. And we can have a try catch here. And we'll say catch ex, and we'll just route to the console if it fails. So that will um, allow us to not crash our application entirely. Um, it's just going to end the application running, but it won't um, make the application uh, have an unhandled exception that closes the application. So, but again, it will close at the end of this because there's no code after this curly brace. Uh, this is a method. It's a local method, but it's a method. So that is what's being called right up here. So with that, we can say services dot get required service. And we're going to ask for required service we don't have yet called app. We're going to create this. And then we're going to say run and pass in our arcs. Okay, so what's this? Well, this is a class we need to create because we need to have an entry point for our application since the console program.cs isn't the entry point. It's going to call an entry point. So let's create a new class. We'll call it app. And we'll do our semicolon here to use file scope namespaces. And we're going to make this public. And for our app, what we're going to do is we're going to have um, 
a run method. Before we do that, let's bring in through a constructor, we're going to bring in iMessages. And that use, add the using statement at the top, messages. So it's asking depends injection to give me my iMessages interface. And we're going to say that, um, actually, let's create it this way, just control dot and create a son of the field. So now we have our messages we can, we can call. And down here, we can say, let's create a method called public void run. And we're going to pass in a string array called arcs. Now, why am I passing in a string array here? Well, if you notice, we're actually passing this in from here, which we got from here, which we got from actually what's hidden behind this program.cs, which is the, we used to have a static void main that had args. Well, it's still kind of there, it's just hidden. And args are the command line arguments that you pass in when you call this application. So if you called it from the command line, then you could pass in arguments to it, and we're gonna wanna capture one of those. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say string lang equals en. So by default, we're gonna have an English language. And let's at the very bottom here say string message equals messages.greeting and pass in our language. And we'll say console write line message, like so. Now this just takes an en for now, it's hard coded. We wanna do better than that. So we're gonna read from the arguments that are passed into our console application at runtime. So we're gonna have a four and we're gonna say uh, args.length like so. So now we're going to loop through every argument looking for if args i to lower starts with and it's a uh, dash lang equals. Okay, so we're gonna that's gonna be our kind of our keyword there to look for. And if that's the case, then we're gonna say lang equals, and that's our our variable up here, lang equals args i substring. And I think it's uh, I think it's six. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So we say substring of six. That should um, that should make sure we skip over the dash lang equals and get just a value after the equals, and that will be our language. And we can just say break because you don't need to keep looking through our args if you find the arg that matches. So, and what happens here is if you were to call this, like say, this will be um, ultimate hello world dot exe. We could say dash lang equals uh, es, like so. And then it's gonna, that's gonna be the parameter that gets passed in. Any spaces means another parameter. So you could say test, and now you have two arguments, this one and this one. And if you were to get sloppy and say something like this, it, this would not be one argument, it would be three. This, this would be one, this would be one, and this would be one. So you can't have spaces there. Which also means you couldn't say something like um, Spanish, language. That would work. We want to have it short and sweet anyways. So yes. So that's how we'd call our, our executable if with the parameter to change this to Spanish. So with that, we now have our run method. And if you come back over here, program.cs, app is still uh, red squiggly. So we control dot here to add the using because this program.cs does not know about the ultimate hello world namespace. Because nothing uses it until app does. So therefore we have to add the using for even the root namespace. Now with this, I think we've got something that should work. Let's run this. 
And it says no service for type ultimate hello world app. Ah, we have not registered our service for it. Services dot add singleton, but it's going to be for app. Let's run it again. There you go. We have successfully created a hello world application, but we're not done yet because how do you know it really works the way you want it to work? We need to create some unit tests for it. Now I could have done it in the, the TDD manner and created um, the unit test first and make sure they failed and then make sure they passed after I wrote some code, but we're gonna just create them now. So right click on solution and we're gonna say add new project and we're gonna create a, let's search for X unit. Wait for it, wait for it. There we go, X unit and hit next. I like X unit personally, uh, N unit just as great. MS test, not always is great, but it's close. So we'll call this um, hello world tests and .NET 6, create. And for this, um, let's go ahead and just delete unit tests one. And we're gonna right click and say, add class. And actually we should probably match the, the folder structure. So let's right click and say, add new folder uh, business logic. And then right click and say, add class. And we'll call this messages tests. And we'll do our semicolon here and make this public. And we're going to have, well, first we have to add a reference in dependencies, add a project reference to our hello world library. Oh, we already have that. Great. That's awesome. Oh, that's the wrong spot. Right click here on dependency under hello world tests and reference our library. There we go. That's much better. So now that we have this, we can create our first fact. And we'll do facts. We, we could do um, we could do theories here, but I think facts will work just fine. So we're going to need to do public void greeting underscore in English. And we're going to say we create an I logger to impersonate the logger. And the way I do that is we actually create a null logger. We could do a mock or we could do something else, but uh, a null logger works fine. That's actually built into what Microsoft provides us with the abstractions um, NuGet package. So I logger of type messages, and we want to have the add the using statement for that. So that's right up here now. We're going to say logger equals new null logger. Notice it's Microsoft.extensions.login.abstractions. And we're going to say messages. So it's added this using statement here. And if we look, I believe it added a NuGet package as well. Oh, no, it's already built in. Sorry. Um, it's built in. It may be um, a transitive, but it is built in um, to have abstractions in our unit test project. So with this, we've now created this new logger, which if you notice, that matches up with what we're looking for, an I logger type messages. But it's a, a null logger, which means it just basically eats the logs. Um, that's what it does. And that's good enough for us for this demo. We are cutting a couple of corners here. We could go again further in depth, make sure our logs are working properly and so on. But we're going to, for the sake of time, cut that corner. So now we can say messages, call it messages, equals new and pass in the logger. Now, normally we instantiate messages through dependency injection. But instead, we're instantiate manually and passing in the uh, the thing it needs. However, just note that if this were a real application, here's another corner we're kind of cutting a little bit, um, is this might have inside of it 
dependencies that also need to be instantiated from dependency injection and down the list it might go. If that were the case, we would either need to manually instantiate every one of those and up here, or we can create our own dependency injection system inside of our test suite that has that injects the uh, the mocked versions of all those things into our our uh, class here. But we don't need to do that since we're only passing in logger, and logger doesn't have any further down dependencies. So now we have our messages class. We can say string expected equals hello world and then string actual equals messages dot greeting in the English language. Okay, so you might say, well, Tim, we're hard coding some things here. We're hard coding hello world. We're hard coding the English language. Yes, that's what unit testing is all about is hard coding those things. And so you have an expected input so therefore we hopefully get an expected output. And if that's the case, assert dot equal expected and actual. If that's the case where what we expect is what we get, then the unit test passes. And if it's not, then it fails. We have to look into why is our expectation not being met? If we pass in a known set of inputs, we should get a known output. And if we don't, something weird's going on. Okay, let's copy this fact. This is why I say we could have done a theory because there's actually um, another one we can say, which is Spanish. And if we pass in ES, we should get Hola Mundo. And make sure that's correct. And then one more that I'm going to paste it in, but really it's going to change. Invalid. So we're going to pass in something invalid. And let's even get rid of our expected and our assert and even the assignment here. And we're going to say, actually, let's put on a line up above here. Assert throws invalid operation exception. That's the exception we're expecting. And then two parens and then our arrow and then our pass in this right here. And let's, um, let's put this on a new line. Like so, okay. So we're saying assert, this is going to throw this exception. So if we call this, not with EN, but with, let's say FR, we don't have French. If we call it French, it should throw an invalid operation exception because we don't have French. And that assertion is going to say, did it throw that exception? And if it did, then we're good. because We had an expected output or an outcome based upon a given input. So we gave it bad data. We should expect back an exception of this type. So let's now go to our test explorer and run all three tests. If you don't have Test Explorer open, you can go under the Tests menu and go to Test Explorer. And we get three passing tests. We have success in all three tests. The English return what it was supposed to. Let's go over here. And we can also crunch this down a little bit. So that was successful. The Spanish was successful. And so was the invalid. All right, so we now have unit testing on our class. So at this point, we've got a pretty good system. We've got, it's dry, it does not repeat itself. So when you want, want to add a new message, the custom lookup will handle it. And we can create a new method to handle that new message if you want, or you could turn this into public and then we could call it from anywhere really and just pass the key in. That might be useful as well. And we should probably put some tests against that if we do. We also have dependency injection set up and properly with wrapped in a try catch so that even if we do something weird, it will work. It will not crash the application, but it will not continue running with bad data. And we're asking for this app in this dependency injection, which 
actually properly asks for the iMessages from dependency injection, and that gets pulled in. We check the command line R. We haven't shown that yet, but we can run our application from the command line and pass in a different language, and it will properly get that new language and give us the value back. So all of this should work properly, and we can prove that by running it, and yes, it does. In fact, let's go to our ultimate hello world, right-click on it, and say, let's go to open folder in File Explorer. Wait for that to load somewhere. Oh, there it is. And go to our bin directory, debug, net six. And then we have in here our ultimate hello world. Let's um, right-click and say open terminal. All right, that's a long terminal, but or a long line. But we can say ultimate hello world.exe dash lang equals es. And it says the ultimate hello, oh, we're in PowerShell. That's why. Uh, let's do this. Let's clear the screen first. And I believe it is dot slash. All right, the short switch lang equals es is not defined in the switch mappings at the command line configuration. I believe this is actually because of the dash. Let's go ahead and fix that real quick. We can close this out. We'll leave the terminal open. Um, let's change this to just take a dash off and that means five characters. And let's rebuild the project. Rebuilt. And now let's clear the screen and run it again, and we get that same error, which is interesting because we don't have that dash lang equals es. Oh, yes, we do. We just called it. How about that? Hola mundo. Okay, so now if we run this and pass in the language of es, we get hola mundo. And if we were to run it again and pass in the language of en for English, we get hello world. So this now works even the command line and passing in the different languages. So we now have what really can be the ultimate hello world application that is flexible. It's ability to, it can grow over time. If we had a different language, we could just punch that into our, um, into our JSON file and it would just work. Now uh, our unit test, test for French, we probably shouldn't do that, but um, we should probably test for um, something worse like test. Um, let's do that. That's invalid data, okay? Um, so now we can come back over here and run our tests again, just make sure they run again. They do. Um, so with that, we could put French in here and we could come back to our terminal and run it again and get the uh, the French version really quickly. So let's validate this. So we're going to put a, um, let's copy this whole section. Now paste it. We're going to put FR for French and I'm going to copy. I'm not going to begin to butcher that with my pronunciation, but there's the, what Google says, the, the French um, translation for hello world is. So now let's build this again. Let's rebuild it. We can actually just build, but Let's bring back our terminal and I actually close the terminal down, but if you reopen it, it does have your history on here. So English, let's make sure it runs. Hello world and Spanish, hola mundo. And now FR and the, the French translation. So now we have this flexible hello world application that can even say hello world in other languages. So we can grow and change over time and this, this thing will just work. And you know what? In some ways that's admirable. It's admirable we have such a powerful, flexible application. But do you notice all the complexity we have here? So we have, let's look at this. We have three different projects. We have the Hello World Library, Hello World Tests, and Ultimate Hello World. So three different projects. In there, we have in the main application, we have two classes. In the Hello World tests, we have two classes. In the library, we have one, two, three, 
four files, uh, two classes, an interface, and our JSON file. So we got a lot of files, and then inside there is a lot of logic. So you have all of this, you know, 54 lines of code here, and we have another 29 lines of code here, another 31 lines of code here. We have, well, we want to count testing, but 44 lines of testing. Um, and, you know, we have a model. There's a lot of stuff going on here. And the end result, after all is said and done, is it prints out Hello World. So I want to ask you, is all of this better than the first application we had? The first application we had had one line of code. And it said, console, right line, hello world. Is this better than what we had? And the answer is, it depends. It depends on your ultimate goal. If your ultimate goal is just to have a hello world application, then absolutely not. This is awful compared to what we had. Because even though this is so powerful, it's so set for the future, it's all this stuff, this is a maintenance nightmare. Because you've got a lot of code that the end result is it prints out one line of text. It would be much better to have the console write line hello world and be done. And this is why if you create a, a function project, so if we come here on a solution and say a new project, and search for uh, Azure Functions, all right? And let's just create a function app, um, demo function. And in here, it's gonna ask us what kind, HTTP triggers fine, basically it's a, a tiny little API. Um, use Azure right to run storage count, sure. Um, not Docker, authorization is function level, sure. Okay, we're gonna hit create. If you notice, that the Azure function has in it just this one function, one.cs, which of course you should rename to something else, but it has it one file. And in here, we have a total of, including the curly braces and all the spaces, 35 lines of code. That's the entire Azure function. And if we were to really, you know, kind of trim us down a little bit, we could make it a little bit smaller, but that's it. That's our entire code base for this Azure function. Now tell me, do we need to make this more complex by adding dependency injection um, by which, by the way, we could add quite easily, but do we need to? Probably not. Do we need to make sure we have you know, a lot of extra stuff around this, make it dry, make sure we have you know, class libraries against it and all that? Probably not because we really have about 20 lines of code that by the way, already has logging, just so you know. Um, so we're already pretty good, um, but that's all we needed to worry about with our application. So we probably should try and keep this as simple as possible. And if we can have just this one file, because even though we may have a little bit of repetition, even though he could abstract something away, it's probably not ideal to do so, okay? So maybe we could say, hey, you know what? We've got this, this query that's got a, a magic string. You know, everybody loves to say the word magic or the phrase magic string. It, yeah, we do. It says name. You know what? We're gonna have to have that string somewhere. So here is probably the best place for it because it's right next to the code that uses it. If we abstract this away into a dictionary file with static resources and, and bring that in with, you know, some kind of enum or something else, that just makes it more complicated. So I want you to start thinking when you're looking at best practices, when you're looking at design patterns, when you're looking at even something as simple as dry, do I really need to do that? Do I really need to be more dry? Do I really need to have that additional stuff? Because if you're not careful, you end up creating hello world applications like this. 
Now, yes, this is a um, an overly dr- dramatic example of what it can be because really it's a lot more subtle than that. It's it's something that you say, well, of course we need to have. Be very careful whenever you say that because there are very few things that you absolutely have to have. Sometimes you can get away with not having them and it may be better. It may be better not to have because it reduces your complexity. And reduced complexity is a valuable thing to have. So the things I've shown today are very, very good things. They're things that I would encourage you to consider on all of your projects. But do not ever get into the place where you say, I have to do X in every project. Don't do that. Don't get so locked in that you actually hurt your own projects in the name of doing what's right. Being a developer is about being able to be pragmatic. What is best for this particular situation? This came up when I built my website. I'm not sure if you saw that yet. The new IamTimCorey.com has been built. Uh, We built that with HTML, CSS, and a little bit of custom JavaScript, vanilla JavaScript. I didn't use Angular. I didn't use React. I didn't use Vue. I didn't use C Sharp. I didn't use Blazor. And people were aghast, astounded, and amazed that I hated C Sharp so much that I wouldn't use it. And that's not the case. But what it is, is I was trying to be pragmatic. We're going to have uh, more content coming very soon about my decision-making process with that, about how I work through the idea of what is the best uh, tool set for this problem. So we'll get there, but I want to kind of take this opportunity here because I've seen this a lot with developers. They get locked into, I have to have X. There, like I said, there's nothing bad in this entire demo. These are all great things. And these are all great practices to follow. But be careful that you don't shoot yourself in the foot trying to do what's best. Because sometimes what's best is to have one method with a few lines of code, and that's it for the entire application. Or sometimes it's best to have console, right line, hello world. And that's it. Okay? So... I hope you found this valuable. Like I said, there's, this was kind of a weird one because there's, I'm going to show you a lot of great stuff and how to you know, start into those things uh, like dependency injection and unit testing and logging and all the rest. But I kind of touched on just the tops of them. We have videos going into them in more depth. But on the other hand, I want to make sure that when I show you these things that you don't say, okay, I have to add these in every project. Okay, so be careful of that. Be careful that you um, know the balance Look at the pros and cons and make sure that you don't get locked into, I have to do X in order to be best. Because again, so as the best is one line of code. All right. Thanks for watching. Thanks for uh, coming along on this ride. Hopefully you got a lot of valuable tips and, and tricks and ways of doing things out of this video. Leave comments down below. It helps the video and helps um, spread the word. But also, let me know if you, you know, what your thoughts were on this. Is is there more things I missed? I'm sure there definitely are. I could have wrapped these things in nuke packages and so on. But what are the things that you would throw in there um, to make the ultimate hello world application? What extra things would you add? Um, if you want this code, um, I will bundle it up and make sure that's available. Use the link in the description. It will send you an email with the code. Okay, thanks for watching. And as always, I am Tim Corey.